Today, we are going to be looking at the prophetic context of Christ's first coming. This is session one of two. However, my next session will not be until a month from now. Okay, so you'll be able to see this one, and then I will try to refer you back to this one when you look at the second one and make sure that you know that there was the first one, all right? So today we're going to be looking at the prophetic context of Christ's first coming. Let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. Now, Father God, we thank you so much for this time that we can be together. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for this country that we live in, that we can meet in freedom. And it's still not against the law to study your word. And we look forward to the day that we will dwell in your presence eternally. And uh, there are some things that have to go on between now and then, we know. And just pray that uh, as much as we are able, that we would be able to be your faithful servants uh, in these days ahead. And so now I pray that you'd give me the right words, have everybody's heart attentive and participative as we go through our study today. Pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So as I mentioned, the prophetic context of Christ's first coming. So obviously the main topic here is going to be Christ's first coming. And so as we look at this, we're going to be taking a look at prophecy regarding Christ, and we are going to go through a bunch of them. And you're going to help me a little bit as we identify these things, and you're going to help me to see if and when these things have been fulfilled. Okay, so these are prophecies that we see in Scripture, and I'll give you an example here. The prophecy of the Messiah being the seed of a woman. We see that in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, and it says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. So there we see the woman. And so this is talking to Satan, by the way. So God is going to put enmity between Satan and the woman, and between Satan's seed, which would be the Antichrist eventually, and um, between thy seed and her seed, her seed eventually being the Messiah. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heels. So in other words, the Messiah will bruise the head of, well, Satan. And Satan will only bruise his heel. In other words, it will be a lethal blow for what God will do or the Messiah will do to Satan and to his progeny for that matter. Now, let me ask you, would we say that this has been fulfilled and when? Has this been fulfilled? Have we seen a woman, for example, give birth to a baby that we would say be, would be the person who would fulfill that? Yes, okay. And that woman would be whom? Mary. Mary, okay. And that child would be? Jesus. Jesus. Okay, so I think you would agree with me that this has been fulfilled, yes? yes. All right, so we know she's going to, the Messiah is going to be born of a woman. And that's already been fulfilled as we have studied Scripture, as we know Scripture. Here's another one for you. Of the seed of Abraham. So if this person is really going to be the Messiah, is really going to be the one who is supposed to do all the stuff, that we're talking about eventually, then first of all, had to be born of woman. But let me ask you, how many, how many people in this world have been born of a woman? All of them, right? All right, so that doesn't narrow it down very much in that sense, does it? All right, but, but we know that we'll be born of a woman, but then be born of the seed of Abraham. Now, does that kind of narrow things down a little bit? Absolutely, it does limit things a little bit, and we see that in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3, where it says, And I will bless them that bless thee, and this is God talking to Abram or Abraham, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. This is the reference to the Messiah who will come one day. And so my question would be, has that been fulfilled, that there is going to be someone from the family line of Abraham, who is also of the seed of the woman, Okay, so now, does that limit that a little bit? It does, but let me ask you, how many children did Abraham have, and then how many children did Abraham's family have? And by the way, how many Jewish people are there in the world today? Because they're all of the seed of Abraham, aren't they? Okay, so now we're talking, well, did you know that there were about 12 million Jewish people just prior to World War II, and during that time of the Holocaust, about six million of them died? Okay, it was within the last five years or so that they finally got back up to 12 million Jewish people. And now they're up, I think, 14 or 15 million Jewish people in the world today. So it's taken a long time for them. But they're all of the seed of Abraham, and they're also of the seed of a woman. All right, so, but we've limited some things, I think, but we'd probably say that this one is fulfilled. Next one we can look at, now it might narrow it down a little bit more, from the tribe of Judah. 
And so as we look in Scripture, and let's read here in Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10, and this passage says, The scepter, in other words, the, the rod of leadership of the kingship, shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So the question would be, do we know of anybody who was born of a woman who's from the line of Abraham, who's from the line of Judah, who we would say fulfills this kingship role? And I would say yes, and we would say that that person is whom? Jesus. Isn't that interesting? It keeps falling eventually down to the same person. And so we're, we're narrowing things down, aren't we? But still there's a lot of people from the tribe of Judah, aren't there? That could potentially, because I mean they're all born of the woman, they're all from the tribe or the family of Abraham, and they're all from the line of Judah, aren't they? Well, let's keep working on this then. This person is going to be the heir to the throne of David. So not only then does that mean of the tribe of Judah, but now a descendant of David specifically. And so as we look at that, we look in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, through 7, 6 and 7, and we see it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government, so oh, that's the throne, shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. In other words, this will be eternal. It will not end at a certain point in time. And upon the throne of David. So there specifically from the tribe of David is where this person needs to be from. Uh, and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth. Even forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So God certainly will perform this. And so do we know anybody who's of the woman, who's of Abraham, who's of, what was the next one? Uh, uh, Judah and, and David. And all, Okay, do we know of anybody who then specifically is this li of this line of David? And it does narrow down, doesn't it? it actually, it, it comes through now two people because it's of the woman. That would be Mary. All right, but did you know that also Joseph, the father, even though he was not the biological father, was still of the same lineage? All right, so now this really does start to pinpoint some things, doesn't it? And so we see then that that would very likely be what we would consider to be fulfilled. Put that seal of our approval on it. Yeah, sometimes I talk to the Lord and I say, you know, God, like when I come out of my house in the morning, or late, late at night, and I come out of my house, and my house faced directly east. And so when I turn left onto my sidewalk to go to my car, I look up, the North Star is always there. And I look up at that North Star and I say, God, you never cease to amaze me. You know, it sounds very arrogant. You know, God, you impress me. <laughs> I don't mean to do that, but this has our seal of approval. Let's narrow it down a little bit more. Okay? Was this person born in this specific city? But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, or Ephrata, that, by the way, is very, very specific because there is another Bethlehem further north in Israel, okay, but this one is Bethlehem Ephrata. Uh, thou, though, excuse me, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, so definitely the tribe of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, and those going forth have been from old, from everlasting. Now, um, what was it that Joseph and Mary did before their child was born? They went to Bethlehem. Why? Because they were taking the census. Why did they have to go to Bethlehem? That's where they were from. That's their family line was from there. And that family line, wait a minute, where was King David from? Bethlehem, exactly. Where was he a shepherd? Outside of Bethlehem in that region there. Okay, of course they wandered a little bit and things like that. But we see this narrowing down again to fulfilled. Right? In Christ. All right, we keep on going then. He had to come at a specific time. Did you realize that? It's not like he could have just shown up any time. He had to come at a specific time. And let me back up just a moment. How many people in the world can say when they were born that they came at a time that somebody else spoke about them? Do you have control of the day that you're born? No, you don't, do you? Okay, who is it that controls the day that you're born? Okay, God does. Uh, do you have actually control of the day that you die? No, you don't. Now, I got to tell you, I'm on a diet. Why? Because I want to look mean and lean. All right? 
However, it's not going to change the date of my death, but it may allow me to bend over and touch my toes for longer. Okay, it may allow me to be more comfortable for longer. It may allow me to be able to enjoy life in a, in a certain way longer. Okay, so, but we can't control the time that we're born, can we? Nor can, for example, Jesus control that he's, well, he, well, I mean, as a human being, he can't control that he's born of a woman, that he's born of the family line of Abraham, that he's born of the tribe of Judah, that he's born of the family line of King David, or that he's born in Bethlehem. He can't control any of those things as no other human being can either, unless there's something specific going on. And not only that, he had to be born at an appointed time. And we see the very, very specific time that allows this to happen. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, that's a very specific point in time, unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. So now that means that the Messiah the Prince has got to be able to be on scene at the end of these 69 weeks in order for him to be able to accomplish what is going to happen. Okay, now, that means he had to be, be born slightly before that so that he is, is of an age in order to be able to walk into the city of Jerusalem. So, uh, he shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And it goes on beyond that. And it talks about, though, um, how we know that the Messiah will be cut off after that 69 weeks. In other words, he will be killed after that 69 weeks. And so Jesus had to be here on this earth to fulfill all of those prophecies, not only those, but had to be here at a specific time in history in order to be able to fulfill this prophecy. So was the Messiah here at the appointed time as prophesied by Daniel hundreds of years before he actually showed up? Absolutely he was. That one would be fulfilled. All right, we already talked about this one. Okay, born of a virgin, Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, or born of a woman. Wait a minute, virgin is different than woman, isn't it? I mean, how many women do you know that are virgins when they give birth? None. I want you to think carefully about that. All right, none. All right, only one. Only one. And it was prophesied that there would be one. So for Jesus to be born of the only one, think about the numbers that are involved here. Okay, in terms of the probabilities of this to happen. It says, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. And I think that we can suggest that that was fulfilled in Jesus, wasn't it? Okay. Now I'm building up to something here. It's going to take me a little while to get there because we kind of want to look at the whole lifespan of Jesus. Okay. Jesus being pre uh, preceded by a messenger. Okay, a messenger. Can you guys think of a messenger that would fulfill this? Behold, it says, that I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Who was the messenger of Jesus? John the Baptist. What was his relationship to Jesus? He was a cousin, right? Related to him. And keep in mind now, this Virgin Mary goes and visits, what was John the Baptist's mother's name? Elizabeth. Okay, Elizabeth, right? And they go and visit. What happens in the womb of Elizabeth? All right, John the Baptist jumped for joy. Didn't get very far, but jumped for joy in the mother's womb. Okay, and so we know that there was a messenger. And later on down the line, because of the exact timing of the book of Daniel, we know that Jesus shows up on the scene. And we know just prior to that also that this messenger is there. Okay, six months born, born six months ahead of time, or about that, right? And so here's this messenger. So that messenger had to be on time to be born at the right time. I would suggest to you John the Baptist does fulfill that, and therefore we can say that this was fulfilled. How about this next one? How many kings can you think of in history that would have ridden an animal into their city, triumphant, victorious, and those kinds of things? Okay, just, I may tell you, the big deal was, for example, if you were a Roman leader coming back from battle, you'd have a procession of soldiers going before you, and then you would be on the biggest, baddest horse in town. And you would ride that horse in, and you would have your generals riding behind you, and we see that reported history and history and history again and again and again. Now, out of all of those guys that did that, how many rode in on a mule or a donkey? 
Okay, very, very few. You know, we could say, we could say maybe some of them did if we wanted to. But here in the book of, of Zechariah, it talks about this. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation lowly, in other words, humble, and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. In other words, a donkey, baby donkey, if you will. Okay, Small donkey. Do we see that in scripture? Was there anybody in scripture that you know of that rode into town on a donkey who would have been considered the king? Okay, Jesus, exactly. Okay, so all of these things blending together. You know, and somebody tried to be very conservative in their estimates, and you'll notice here as I say that this is fulfilled. One guy said that maybe one out of a hundred people that rode into a city, triumphant, rode in on a donkey. That's very conservative, wouldn't you think? I mean, if you were a conqueror, would you choose to ride in on a donkey? No, probably not, but this person was trying to be conservative and said that maybe a hundred rode in on a donkey. Now, every once in a while, look up in the corner and you'll see some of these numbers pop up there because this guy, his name was Pat, uh, um, Peter Stoner. Okay? He was a mathematician and he tried to calculate what the probability was that just eight prophecies could be fulfilled in any one person. If I have time at the end, we'll get into that in more detail. But start thinking mathematically about the probabilities of these kinds of things happening. And maybe one in a hundred, I doubt that that's even accurate, is probably a whole lot less than that, of a ruler, a king, would ride into a city on a donkey. Instead, they would either be carried in or they would be riding some kind of a majestic animal. What are the chances of a, the person that Scripture is talking about being betrayed by a friend for 30 pieces of silver? What are the chances? I mean, think about all the people that have ever been betrayed in history. How many of them could have been specifically betrayed with 30 pieces of silver? Okay, that, that's kind of narrowing down things, isn't it? I mean, we've already narrowed things down already a lot, and now we're bringing it down even more. And in Zechariah chapter 11 and verse 12, it says, And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price. If not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. And we know that somebody did be, betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And that guy's name was Jesus. Judas. Exactly. Exactly. Now, somebody said, okay, so, of course, being fulfilled, that maybe one out of a thousand people who have been betrayed may have been betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. I doubt that number. I mean, that's very specific, isn't it? 30 I mean, it may be $3,000, or it may be you know, $300 or something, but 30 pieces of silver specifically, I find that hard to believe, but they tried to be conservative, and they said maybe one out of 1,000 people who were betrayed were betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Anyway, I would suggest that that was fulfilled. We see that in scripture, Judas having been the one who betrayed. You know, the thing that's interesting um, is that what did Judas do with that money? He went and he tried to give it back, didn't he? And they took that money and what did they do with it? They bought a potter's field. You know, that's also in prophecy. I mean, what are the chances then of a thousand guys that are betrayed by one person for 30 pieces of silver that then that money is used to buy a potter's field specifically? It, it really starts to limit things, doesn't it? Okay. Prophecy is an amazing thing if you get it right. <laughs> if you get it wrong, well... Anyhow, do you know that um, there's also prophecy that says that he's going to be accused by false witnesses, whoever this person is that Scripture is talking about. Psalm 35 talks about false witnesses did rise up and they laid to my charge things that I knew not. In other words, we know that Jesus was innocent and wasn't proven guilty, but it was accused and accepted as an innocent man to bear the weight of the guilty, didn't he? Yeah, so Jesus fulfilled that one, certainly. We continue to move on. How much did Jesus argue regarding his accusations? I mean, if somebody said that you're guilty of doing something, would you argue back? Absolutely, I'm innocent. But, but no, he was silent to his accusers or accusations. Isaiah 53, verse 7 says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his sh or her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. We know that Jesus remained silent, didn't he, when he was being persecuted and when he was being accused and did not argue against. And so that one certainly fulfilled in the life of Jesus. How well did they treat him? They didn't treat him very well, did they? What did they put on his head? 
crown of thorns, all right? When they saw him, what did they do? They spit upon him, okay? They beat him, didn't they? Isaiah 50 says things, I gave my back to the smiters, and we know that he was beaten terribly, uh, near to the edge of death, and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair, as you said here just a moment ago. And I hid not my face from shame and spitting. And certainly as Jesus is the one who's being beaten, as he's carrying that cross as far as he was able, and we know that that was given to somebody else because Jesus was in such a weak condition to carry that cross the rest of the way, we know that that one certainly was fulfilled. And we know also that Jesus was the sacrificial lamb, wasn't he? As Isaiah 53 verse 5 talks about it. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Not his. Our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Oh man, praise the Lord for that. Fulfilled in Jesus, wasn't it? How about this? Innocent man, crucified, right? Innocent man, crucified. Uh, first of all, I think it's very interesting that as we look at this passage in Isaiah 53, that, um, well, when passages about crucifixion in the Old Testament were written, do you realize that there never was such a thing up to that point in time? Crucifixion didn't exist. What did the Jewish people do when they meted out capital punishment. What was their method? Stoning, exactly. Crucifixion didn't exist at that time. It wasn't until later on that the Romans came and they got really good at that. Okay, and this is where they talk about he hung on a tree, right? But crucifixion didn't exist when a lot of these passages were being written about him hanging on a tree. But Isaiah chapter 53 verse 12 says, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors. Now, let me ask you, were there any transgressor, transgressors who were there with him when he was being crucified? Yes, two, right? Two. Now, the thing I find interesting, a passage of Scripture shows that there were two and they were batting back and forth between themselves, arguing, right? Saying, hey, save yourself, Jesus. But then I noticed later on that one of them says, no, wait a minute. This guy really is God. And he says, remember me today. And Jesus tells him what? Okay, you'll be with me in my kingdom today, won't you? Okay, so it seems to me there was a conversion of heart. Even on the death cross, it seems that one of them came to faith. Praise the Lord for that. Not telling you to wait until the end, because you don't know when the end will be. Okay, but um, it can happen. So anyhow, it says here that he was numbered with the transgressors and he bare the sin of many, yours and mine, even 2,000 years ago, and made intercession for the transgressors. Do you realize that it's you and me that are the transgressors? I mean, even as a Christian who is a believer, we still sin. And our transgression is still upon him. I'm grateful for that, that's for sure. There are struggles that we have. Some things we just can't get out of. And yet still, our sin is upon him. I would suggest to you that that one was fulfilled. Okay, what about this one? Pierced through his hands and feet. That's what happens when you're crucified. Psalm 22, verse 16 says, For the dogs have encompassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. And isn't that how crucifixion is done? Okay, and the whole point being that you have to pull yourself up and stand up as the nails are going through your hands and your feet in order to catch a breath of air. When you got that air, then you let down again and you hold that breath and then you need more and you push back up and exhale and grab another one and you push down. But eventually, the Romans get tired of waiting for your death, don't they? And so we know that that was fulfilled while he was on that cross, he was given vinegar and gall. That's a prophecy. I mean, Jesus could not have controlled, oh, hey, I know I'm hanging up here. Would you please go and get me some vinegar and gall so I can drink that? No, that doesn't make sense, does it? Of course, he's not going to be able to determine that himself. But Psalm 69, verse 21 says that they gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. That one being fulfilled when Christ hung on the cross. What about this one? He's up there on the cross. He knows they've taken his clothing off. 
And they're looking at it and they're saying, hey, this is pretty nice clothing here. This is pretty nice. How about if we go ahead and we gamble for this? Instead of tearing it into pieces, how about if one of us wins it as our own? Psalm 22 talks about that. Do you think Jesus up on the cross would have said, oh, I insist that you guys gamble for my clothing while I'm hanging up here? No, no. This is written years and years, 100 years, 200 years. Well, there were 400 silent years from the book of Malachi forward, so it's even older than that, before the time of Jesus. And we know Psalm 22, verse 18 says, They part my garments among them and cast lots for my vesture. Being fulfilled, not in Christ's control in the sense of a human being being able to control this, fulfilled. Now here's the point that I was going to make a little bit earlier. As they're pulling themselves up and then letting down and pulling themselves up and letting down, eventually the Romans get tired of it. And so to ensure that this person dies on the cross, what is it that they do? They break his legs, break his bones, okay? The, below the knee and the ankle so that you can't lift up. And what was it that happened when they went to break the bones of Jesus? He was already dead, wasn't he? And what was it that that one soldier did to ensure that he really was dead? Okay, he pierced his side, didn't he? And what is it that came out? Was it just pure blood? No, blood and water. So that heart sack would have been destroyed at that point in time. And it says here in this passage of scripture that no bones were broken. Jesus even fulfilled this one, dying ahead of the time that the Romans would have allowed. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. That one being fulfilled by Christ as well. And then what happened in his burial? Okay, he was buried with the rich. I mean, think about it, was Jesus rich? No, so why should he be buried with the rich? How could you plan that out ahead? I mean, you know, nowadays you can go down to the local funeral home and you can pre-plan your, your burial, can't you? But would Jesus have been able to do that? No, because these were family burial places for the most part. Or there was a place for the dead that nobody wanted. And yet, here this man is buried with the rich. In Isaiah 53 verse 9 it talks about that. He made his grave with the wicked, with the rich in his death. Okay, so here we've got a tomb that we know belonged to a rich man, and they brought his body down at the end of the day. We know that the Sabbath is about to begin. And so they take this body just around the corner from where he was crucified to the tomb of a rich man. It was carved out of the stone. It was in a garden area. It met the fulfillment of scripture there even, that we're not even talking about here. Because he had done no violence, in other words, no evil, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Fulfilled there where Jesus was buried. He had no control over where he was going to be buried. He's dead. He's not going to be telling everybody on the cross, look, uh, I really like that grave over there. Why don't you take me to that one? Here's the one that gets me. And I'm glad about it. Resurrected from the dead. How many people do you know of that have resurrected from the dead? Okay, there's a difference between brought back to life and being resurrected. We know that there was that one guy, right? What was his name that came out of the grave? Okay, Lazarus, but let me ask you, what happened to him a little while later on? He died, all right? So it wasn't permanent, was it? All right, anyhow, we know that Jesus was in fact resurrected from the dead, and it was prophesied that he would. Psalm 16, verses 10 and 11 says, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And by the way, um, they used to say, and keep in mind Lazarus now, when he was in the grave, they used to say that the person's soul definitely left the body after three days. Okay, and so Lazarus, it's very clear, was specifically dead for three days. And so once the soul has left the, the body, there's no way that that person is going to come back to life according to Jewish tradition. And it's interesting that Jesus is the one who was able to overcome that tradition, if you will, and bring Lazarus back to life. Now, they say, though, that the body begins uh, decaying after three days. So isn't it interesting that it's said here that he's not going to see corruption. And we know how many days, you know, three days, three nights, Jesus comes back to life, right? And so he's within that window of time that would have violated that tradition, that would have said, oh no, he's got corruption in his body. No, he didn't, based upon even the tradition. But thou wilt suffer thine holy one to see, or will not, uh, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. How many people get to the sit at the right hand of God? No, not many. 
I'm just curious, would you say that that was fulfilled, that he resurrected from the dead? Now, you didn't see it, but do we have witnesses in Scripture that say they saw it? Absolutely, we do. And he was on the earth for how many days after his resurrection? Forty days. So there's plenty of evidence, plenty of proof. It was definitely an issue back in those days, and that one is fulfilled. And then, as we were mentioning, Scripture says that he'll ascend to the right hand of God. Psalm 68, verse 18 talks about that. It says, Thou hast ascended on high. Uh, did anybody see him ascend? Okay, yes, right? Who were those people? The apostles, right? They were out there wherever he was, and they watched him ascend. Disciples, I think, as well. Thou hast led captivity captive. Now, what that's talking about is up to that point in time, nobody had gone to heaven. In other words, into the presence of God. If you were dead from the time of Abel, think about it, he was the first one who died, wasn't he? That we see in scripture. From the time of Abel forward, if you were a righteous believer in the Lord, whatever that plan was, we know at the time through the sacrificial system, realizing you needed a redemption and that God could provide the redemption, but the Redeemer had not come for all of those people, had he? However, they were held someplace, weren't they? And we know that scripture has the example in the New Testament of, of the rich man. And who else was there? Lazarus. Lazarus. Okay, a guy named Lazarus, right? Or Lazarus. Right? So what is it that we see in that scene? We see that Lazarus is with Abraham. And we see the rich man is where? In hell. Okay? And so what happens is these two places, this, this is, you have the grave and then you have Sheol. Okay? You have this place. But this place is divided into two pieces. And if you go on YouTube, you'll see I have a presentation there called Heaven, Hell, and the Grave. Okay, Heaven, Hell, and the Grave, and it's a two-part um, series. So go to YouTube and look for Heaven, Hell, and the Grave, and I explain this in great depth. Okay, I mean really great depth. So you've got these two places, one for the righteous, one for the unrighteous. When Christ died, he went, and now that he had paid the price for their redemption, because he had died on the cross, his blood was shed, he took them now into heaven. Okay, to be in the presence of God. Christ sat at the right hand of the Father, and the souls of those that were in this righteous place were brought up. That door was closed from that on, then on. Okay? The righteous do not go there anymore. Now they just go straight into heaven. However, this other place where the rich man was, that place continues. And it continues, and it continues, and it will continue until the end of the millennium. Okay? till the end of the millennium. Now, what happens with people when they die now? If they're believers, if they're righteous in, in, in Christ, their soul goes straight into heaven. But those who are not, their soul goes into that holding place until the end. We know, of course, that there's going to be a resurrection of the dead. That's the bodies that are going to then be made incorruptible, and they will be united with the soul in heaven. Praise the Lord. And then those who are alive at that time will also be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. Okay, anybody who comes back to life before the millennium, anybody who comes back to life before the millennium, that's called the first resurrection. We know after the rapture that there are people who get saved on the earth that get saved. They may be beheaded because they are not taking the mark of the beast. Those people, their souls go under the altar of God until the end then there's a passage in Revelation chapter 20 that talks about how they will be brought back to life as well. And that's where it talks about the first resurrection. So anybody who comes to life before the millennium begins, they are part of the first resurrection and they are part of the wedding supper of the Lamb. Because that happens right before the millennium, okay? Everybody else, they wait until the end of the millennium and they are judged. That's where you have the sheep and the goats. All right, but anyhow, we know that the Lord ascends on high. Um, that's where he sets captivity captive, or has um, led captivity captive, so he sets them free now to go to heaven. Thou hast received gifts from men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. I'd say that one was fulfilled. Now, how do we know, actually, that, that, that he's seated at the right hand? Do we have any kind of eyewitness testimony that Christ was seated at the right hand of the Father? Okay, I'm sorry? John and Revelation, okay, do we have anything before that? Stephen. Stephen, exactly. What was it that was going on with Stephen at that time? Okay, he was being stoned. There was another guy who was there at the time. What was his name? Paul. No, not Paul. Saul. Saul. All right, trick question. Okay, Saul was there. He was holding the cloaks of those that were giving capital punishment to Stephen. 
Okay, Stephen was being stoned to death, and he looks up and he sees in heaven, standing next to the Father, Jesus. So we have eyewitness testimony that Jesus was, in fact, in heaven at the right hand of the Father. And we know then that his soul is received, okay, his body is put in the grave. His body, too, will come out of the grave one day in the future. Okay, so we've covered a lot of prophecy just now, haven't we? And those are all fulfilled in the life of one man. Okay. So of all these prophetic texts that we've covered, here's my question. Okay, all of these prophetic texts that we've looked at, I think that we would agree that they were all fulfilled. Okay. And that they were all fulfilled in the life of one person, yes? Okay, and they were all fulfilled in the life of Jesus, yes? So they would clearly point to Jesus being the Messiah. And they would clearly point to him already having been here, correct? Okay, so now let me ask you this tough question. Which one of all of those prophecies was the first coming? Which one was the first coming? I'm sorry? His birth? Okay, so then him being taken, for example, to the temple and being dedicated, was that part of his first coming? Okay, that wasn't a prophecy that we talked about, but it was an event in his life. Okay, so, so when, when he was dedicated at the temple, remember there were uh, two people in the temple that saw him uh, on the eighth day when he was being circumcised and all that stuff, right? Was that not part of his first coming then because it's not part of his birth? Or, what, or was that part of his first coming? Hey, oh, you bring up an interesting point. You're saying that his whole life was his first coming? Now how long was that? 33 years we estimate, right? So his birth, was that part of his first coming? Yes. Oh, let me back up though. Was, was the Lord already on the earth at his birth? Was he there before his birth? Absolutely, nine months before, right at the conception, because we know that the Virgin Mary, right, conceived by being overshadowed by the Spirit of God, and in her womb was conceived the very Son of God, and yet of a woman, of the family of Abraham, of the, well, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, of the tribe of Judah, of the family of David, and all the things that we've just been through, they all come and they culminate in not one point, but in a 33-year point. Am I right? Okay, so I'm not stretching this, am I? No, so Christ's first coming, I think we would all agree, was not a single point in time, but it took a period of time to be considered his first coming. And it ended with his ascension into heaven, and we know he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. Now, with that in mind, I want you to then think forward to my next presentation. And that's going to be talking about the prophetic context of Christ's second coming. Because I know that people talk about the second coming and they pinpoint a certain event. Or that certain event. This is the second coming of the Lord. That's the second coming of the Lord. And yet we can't do that looking at his first coming, can we? So then it makes sense to me that that same logic can be applied to his second coming, and that's why I would invite you back to my next session for the second coming of Christ. Okay, now, with that said, this presentation is formally done. However, I invite you to stay seated for a little bit more, okay, a bonus. Since I spoke so fast and you listened so well, okay, we're gonna to go to a little bonus here. Now you know I had those texts up there as we were talking about the context of Christ's first coming and as trying to lead into the context of Christ's second coming. I had those passages up there as we were going through some of these things that had certain numbers that were identified in the top right corner. Okay, and this guy then, Peter Stoner, that I was talking about, he did some mathematical calculations. Many of you I'm sure have heard this, but I just wanna refresh your mind about this as we look at these things. Peter Stoner was a professor. He wrote a book called Science Speaks. This is done in 1958, and it was published by Moody Press. This guy was a smart guy. Okay, he was the chairman of mathematics and astronomy at Pasadena City um, College in 1953, and he was there for a period of time. He ended up moving on to Westmont College in Santa Barbara, California, where he uh, was in charge of the science division there. So he was a scientist, and he wanted to make sure that everything that he did 
was based upon scientific principle to the most, best of his ability. He also ended up retiring Professor Emeritus of the Science Division at Westmont in 1958, which is the same year that he wrote his book called Science Speaks. Okay, now, he did the calculation of eight messianic verses coming to pass. Now, how many did we just go over? Was it more than eight? Yes. Okay, I, you know what, I should have counted them. And I actually came up with a list of them, and I saved them last night, and I never counted them. They're more than eight, right? I, more than 16? Okay, more than 16? I've got somebody counting over here. Okay, how, how many do you think? 20, 20, 21? Okay, I got 21. How about 22? Does anybody give me 22? All right, 21. All right, so we're definitely above and beyond these eight, correct? Definitely above and beyond these eight. All right, so this guy calculated the probability of eight messianic prophecies, specifically about the Messiah being fulfilled in the life of one man, in particular in the life of Jesus, since we've narrowed that down. And so all of his estimates were limited, were very conservative, as we've already kind of alluded to. I mean, the chances of, uh, you know, a thousand people who are soldiers, who are generals, who are actually leaders of the army, riding into their city triumphant on a on a donkey are, are, are minimal, right? I mean, and yet he says that, you know, quite a number, one out of a hundred or whatever the number was. So he was thinking, no, I'm trying to be generous, all right? But multiplying all these probabilities together. Now, don't get ahead of me, because some of you already know what number I'm talking about. All right, don't get ahead of me. But multiplying all these probabilities together for eight different prophecies that he's looked at conservatively, and rounding that number off, you get one person out of 10 to the 28th power. However, we can't use that number, and the reason is because it's limited to a certain number of people that have ever existed in, in life, right? So what this um, guy has done then is he divided that number, 1 times 10 to the 28th power, by an estimate of the number of people who have lived since the time of those prophecies until 1958, okay, that would have been about 88 billion people, and it gives the probability of all those eight prophecies being fulfilled accidentally, and that's a key word here, accidentally in the life of one person. Because a lot of people say, well, he wasn't the Messiah, Jesus wasn't the Messiah. It just accidentally happened to have occurred in his lifetime. Now, again, I already mentioned how could it be accidental that he was of that line, that he was born so that he would meet the criteria to be able to walk into Jerusalem at that right time, that he was going to be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, that the 30 pieces of silver were going to be returned and they would buy a potter's field, and that he'd be hanging on the cross with the wicked, and yet we know that he's innocent, and then he's buried in the tomb of a rich man, and they, they cast lots for his clothing. I mean, how is it possible for him to make those decisions? It's not possible. So this is not, I mean, for the possibility of this to be accidental then, he's done, again, just based upon eight prophecies being fulfilled. One person out of 10 to the 17th power. Okay, so let's look at that. What does that mean? One person out of this number of people is the probability that that would happen for eight prophecies in the life of any one person. Okay, now let me wrap that around your head a little bit more. All right, and we're going to explain this. Okay, so this is one person in 100 quadrillion. Okay, now I'm going to give you, I'm going to, you're going to help me out here, okay? So these are the thousands, these are the hundreds of thousands, these are the millions, these are the, and these are the, and these are the quadrillions, okay? So you can see 100 quadrillion, okay? So in other words, for this to happen accidentally, you would have to have 100 quadrillion people to have lived for one person to have that fulfilled in their life. All right, now let me give you an example of this, okay? And you've probably already heard, heard this example, all right? But the example is looking at the great state of, can you see that? I know it's a very thin line, it's hard to see. Okay, Texas, all right? Now, is Texas the largest state in our, in our uh, no, which is the largest? Okay, but it's the largest state in our lower 48, isn't it? Yes, all right, so here we are, the great state of Texas. How many of you are from Texas? Ah, how many of you have been to Texas? All right, that's better. I want to make you all feel good, all right? But now let's say if we were going to get that number of silver dollars, okay, and we're going to cover the whole state of Texas with silver dollars, all right? Oh, you know what? Covering the whole state of Texas with silver dollars is not enough. That's not 100 quadrillion. If you laid all of them together side by side, nice and neat, and you covered the whole state from border to border, north to south, 
that's not enough. You have to get it two feet deep. Two feet deep in order to get 100 quadrillion quarters, or I mean not quarters, but um, dollar bills, okay? Silver dollars. Now, now let me say though, do you, see th do you see that one right there? It's the red one, do you see that red one? So out of those 100 quadrillion, we are going to paint one of them red. And now what we're going to do is we're going to bring a hurricane and it is going to blow against the state of Texas and it's going to make tornadoes and it's just going to mix up all of those silver dollars. Okay? That's a lot of silver dollars. Two feet deep. Whole state now all mixed up. Really, really mixed up. Then what we're going to do is we're going to get a blind person. Right? And we are going to put a parachute on this blind person. And then we are going to throw them out of an airplane. And we are going to set that thing so that it opens up at 3,000 feet automatically. We don't want to kill them, right? And they are going to land someplace in the great state of Texas. Take off their parachute. They can't see a thing. They're blind. And they are going to walk as long as they want over this two feet deep of silver dollars. And then when they feel like it, whether it's right then when they land or a month or two later, whenever they feel like stopping, they bend over, they dig as deep as they want, and they pull out one silver dollar, and it happens to be the red one. That's the chances of eight prophecies being fulfilled by accident in the life of one person. Okay, so that's pretty amazing. Now, here's the problem. Jesus didn't just fulfill eight prophecies, did he? So let's multiply that by two. So the chances of fulfilling 16 prophecies in a single person, you would have to have 10 to the 45th power of people, okay? 10 to the 45th power, oh boy, now this is getting tough. That's one person in one quattro decillion, okay? One quattro decillion, okay? Now, but that's, not, that's only 16 prophecies. What did we say? 21 is what we said, all right? So now let's go out of the realm of the 21 that we've talked about. 16 times 3 is what? 48. So we're going to triple. Okay, we're going to triple the 16. That now takes us to one person in 10 unquinquagintillion. All right? In other words, that's 1 to the 157th power. Okay, in other words, there has to have been one person out of this massive number. Now, let's, let's really get a reference so that we can understand this a little bit better. Okay, so let's take a look at all of the people that are alive now. Okay, do you know how many people are alive now on the earth? Okay, 7.6 billion right now. And it's growing, of course. That's 7.6 times 10 to the ninth. Now, what was that number just a moment ago? 157. Okay, so this doesn't even begin to approach that number of people, right? So at this point, it's, well, keep going. What about all the people that have ever lived? Okay, now maybe we're getting closer, right? Now maybe we're getting closer. All the number of people that have ever lived. You know, the scientists, they say, if you look at the evolutionary tree, they say that Homo sapiens appeared for the first time 50,000 years ago. So using that number and trying to figure out how long people lived and you know, looking at major hurricanes and devastation and plagues and all of that kind of stuff. You know, they say that the number of people, by the way, they say that there are more people on the earth now than have ever lived, ever. In other words, you take all those people and you add them together, there are more people on the earth now than have ever lived, is what they say, which was 7.6 billion. However, if you do the calculations based upon that 50,000 years, they say that there have been 114 billion people. Now we're at 7.6 now, so they say at the most there's been 114 billion. That's not, well, I mean, that's a lot, but that's not, the, the, definitely the idea, if we've got more people living on earth now than have ever lived ever, that's a fallacy, okay? So they're saying 114 billion people have ever lived. Right now, 7.6 of them alive on the earth, okay? So that number there, that's 1.14 times 10 to the 11th. Is that anywhere near what we had just read for, what was that, 48 prophecies? Was right? Uh, is that right? We were looking at 48 prophecies. It was 157, right? Was it 48 prophecies? I think so. What about all the number of atoms in the earth? Okay. Let's look at that. I mean, that's a lot, isn't it? Think about it. There are people that are really smart, 
You know, and they say that they know that there's iron and they know that there's silicon and they know the, what all of this stuff is made of and they know the size of it and they know supposedly the weight of the earth and based upon that kind of information, they've come up with calculations that all of the atoms in the earth, all of the atoms in the earth are this number here. I'm, I, I don't have the dictionary definition for what that number is. I'm not even going to try. All right, but that number right there is one person in 10 to the 50th power. So in other words, all of the atoms of the earth do not come near the chances of those prophecies being fulfilled in the life of Jesus. And that was what for 48, for 48 we said it was, right? 101 times 10 to the 157th. Okay, so we're only up to 10 to the 50. So you would have to have every atom be a person and still not approach the probability that those 48 prophecies could be fulfilled in the life of Jesus. All right, well, let's get bigger then. What's the next biggest thing that you can think of that we're floating around? All right, the sun. All right, they talk about how it's made out of hydrogen atoms and they know what the mass of it is and all this kind of stuff. And they've done some amazing calculations, whoever they are. And they say all the atoms in the sun, based upon the best knowledge that's available today, is this number right here. Okay, all the atoms in the sun. For those of you that are taking notes, you're just gonna be in a bad way, that's all I can tell you. <laughs> all right, I don't think you're gonna get the zeros done in time by the time I get done giving you the information. All right, so just to make that easy, that's 1.1883315 times 10 to the 57th power. Now what did we say? For 48 prophecies to be fulfilled in the life of Jesus, 10 to the 157th. This is not even approached. In other words, there's not enough atoms in the sun to equal the probability of those prophecies, 48 prophecies being fulfilled in the life of Jesus. Wow. Again, the probability here of fulfilling 48 prophecies in the life of Jesus. Okay? Does this seem impossible? Okay, now keep in mind, we're talking about accidental here. Okay, so you would need one person out of this many people in order to have all of that come true in the life of one person. Now, we do have a problem with this math. Okay, and here's the problem with the math. I mean, right now we're talking about 157 zeros as being for these, this number of prophecies. The only one problem is that Jesus fulfilled at least 108. At least 108 at his first coming. And there's a whole lot more that are spoken of for his second coming. And so as far as this being an accidental, in other words, for Jesus to be able to just be born one day and realize, oh, these things are lining up with my life, I'm going to go ahead and make the rest of them. No, it's not possible that there was an accidental fulfillment in the life of Jesus. It has to be that it was God-ordained. So for those of you that are the scientists, go look up Peter Stoner. For those of you that know scientists, tell them to go look up Peter Stoner, right? It's not possible that Jesus accidentally fulfilled eight, much less 48, much less 108 prophecies. There are not enough atoms in the observable universe. Okay, I want you to, I want you to catch this. There are not enough atoms in the observable universe. Now, what does that mean, observable universe? What that means is, you know that Hubble Space Telescope that's out there? Right? It's out there where there's no dirt in the air, there's no moisture, nothing causing the images to be bad, and it's looking out into space. And as far as that thing can see, they think that they have found the end of the universe. Now, we're talking about... Um, I mean, it's 10 to the 23rd galaxies. 10 to the 23rd galaxies is what they're suggesting there is in the observable universe. Okay? In each galaxy, there's, they're saying that there's 10 to the 23rd stars like the sun. Okay? Did I get my numbers messed up? Maybe a little bit. Maybe a little bit. Anyhow, it's a huge number. In other words, the total mathematical computation of all of the atoms in the observable universe is just, I say just, 
10 to the 80th or 82nd power. We're talking about 10 to the 157th in the fulfillment of the life of Jesus. It's not possible that his life was accidental. It had to be on purpose. Okay? All right, well, I hope that was interesting to you. Let's go ahead and close in prayer real briefly, and then we'll let you go. And we thank you, Father, for the day. Thank you for the time. Thank you for everybody's patience. And just for, for how we can see fulfillment in Scripture of prophecy, and then how we can even get scientific if we want, and we can see how it's just not possible that Jesus accidentally or even chose to fulfill those prophecies, lest he be the very Son of God and God's hand be orchestrating every single part of his life. We thank you for that, Father, for that proof. We thank you that uh, you want us to know you this well and even better. And now as we leave here, we pray for your safety, for protection, and um, that we might be a good influence on this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go deeper in your understanding of God, His people, and His plan for planet Earth. Zion's Fire magazine is an exceptional resource with powerful insights from Scripture that provide a clear understanding of God's ultimate plan for the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. As a first-time subscriber, you'll receive a free one-year subscription to Zion's Fire magazine with no strings attached. Request your free subscription by visiting our website or by calling our toll-free number and we'll send you six free issues, one every other month, for a full year. We depend on the generosity of viewers like you to support the ongoing production of these programs. Your donation, whether large or small, is greatly appreciated. Donations may be given online at www.zionshope.org or by calling us toll-free at one 888 7819466 Stay informed and see the latest from Zion's Hope by liking us on Facebook, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on Twitter.